Last week, we dealt with the rather unsettling idea that once our AI capabilities have improved just a little bit more, we may be able to emulate someone within a computer so realistically that they are essentially indistinguishable from the real thing. At that point, we may actually have to redefine what we mean by death. If there is an entity inside a computer that is indistinguishable from the real you, how are you really gone? Well, according to a couple of recent papers, the rabbit hole may go a hell of a lot deeper than that. Let's start with Russian self-styled transhumanist Alexei Turkin. Turkin says that in order to convincingly simulate reality, we need not only much more sophisticated software and hardware, we need a much larger energy source. Emulating a single person with a semi-convincing fake avatar isn't that hard. As we saw last week, it's already basically doable. Emulating an entire civilization within a simulated reality that is so close to the real thing you can't tell the difference, that's a great deal harder. Turkin has suggested that one way to accomplish this is to build a Dyson sphere around the sun. This would capture all of that light and heat that's radiated away into space. I must say that the idea of the Dyson sphere isn't what captured me about Turkin's work. As anyone who is a science fiction aficionado knows, it's been used over and over as a setting in science fiction stories. You may remember the Star Trek Next Generation episode Relics, in which the Enterprise almost got trapped inside one. The technological issues raised by trying to create a Dyson sphere that's stable seem to me to be nearly insurmountable. What raised my eyebrows was the idea that once we have hardware and software sophistication greater than our own and the energy source, wherever you get it from, you might be able to build a reality so convincing that the beings inside it would interact with each other in a completely natural way and might not even know they're in a simulation. Turkin has the following to say. If a copy is sufficiently similar to its original to the extent that we are unable to distinguish one from the other, is the copy equal to the original? If that's not bad enough, there's the even more unsettling idea that if it is possible for us to emulate ourselves inside a computer, that perhaps it's already been done. And we're it. Work by Nick Bostrom of the University of Oxford and David Kipping of Columbia University considered the question from a statistical standpoint. They consider the whole idea a trilemma. There are three possibilities. Intelligent species always go extinct before they become technologically capable of creating simulated realities that sophisticated. Intelligent species don't necessarily go extinct, but even when they reach the state where they'd be technologically capable of it, none of them become interested in simulating realities. And intelligent species eventually becomes able to simulate reality and go ahead and do it. Bostrom and Kipping then analyzed it from the standpoint of Bayesian statistics. The mathematics is a bit above my head, but the gist of it is to consider what it would be like if the possibility number three even had a tiny chance of being true. Let's say that some civilizations eventually have the technological ability to simulate reality. Within that simulated reality, the denizens then evolve. We're talking about AI that's capable of learning here. So some of them develop the ability to create reality within, within a simulation. Kipping calls a universe like this multiparous, meaning giving birth to many. Once this sort of ball gets rolling, you eventually create a nearly infinite number of nested universes. Some of them will fall apart or go extinct, just as in a computer game, admittedly a lot simpler situation, one of your characters can die and disappear from the game. But if even some of them survive, the recursive process continues and it generates an essentially unlimited number of Matryoshka doll-type universes. Then Kipping asked the question that blew my mind. If this is actually true, what's the chance of our universe being the base universe? In other words, the original, the one that all the others come from. And his answer is almost zero. Kipping said, if humans create a simulation with conscious beings inside it, such an event would change the chances that we previously assigned to the physical hypothesis. You can just exclude that hypothesis right off the bat. Then you are only left with the simulation hypothesis. The day we invent that technology, it flips the odds from a little better than 50-50 that we are real to almost certainly we are not real, according to these calculations. It would be a very strange celebration of our genius that day. The whole thing reminded me of a conversation near the end of my novel, Sephiroth. It was between the main character, Duncan Kyle, and the enigmatic Sphinx. How much of what I experienced was real, Duncan said. This point really bothers you, doesn't it? 
Of course, it's kind of critical, you know. Why? Her basso profundo voice dropped even lower, making his innards vibrate. Everyone else goes about their lives without worrying much about it. Even so, I'd like to know. She considered for a moment. I could answer you, but I think you're asking the wrong question. What question should I be asking? Well, if you're wondering whether what you're seeing is real or not, the first thing to establish is whether or not you are real. Because if you're not real, then it rather makes everyone else's reality status a moot point, don't you think? Duncan opened his mouth, stared at her for a moment, and then closed it again. Surely you have some kind of clever response meant to dismiss what I've said entirely, she said. You can't come this far, meeting me again after such a long journey, only to find you've run out of words. I'm not sure what to say. The Sphinx gave a snort and a shower of rock dust floated down onto his head and shoulders. Well, say something. I mean, I'm not going anywhere, but at some point you'll undoubtedly want to. Okay, let's start with this. How can I not be real? That question doesn't even make sense. If I'm not real, then who is asking the question? And you say you're not a philosopher, the Sphinx said, her voice shuddering a little with a deep laugh. No, but really, answer my question. I cannot answer it because you don't really know what you're asking. You looked into the mirrors of Da'at and saw reflections of yourself over and over, finally vanishing into the glass. Yes, millions of Duncan Kyles all looking this way and that, each one complete and whole and wearing the charming, befuddled expression you excel at. Okay. Had you asked one of those reflections, which is the real Duncan Kyle and which are the copies, what do you think he would have said? I see what you're saying, but still, all of the reflections, even if they'd insisted that they were the real one, they'd have been wrong. I'm the original, they're the copies. You're so sure? A man who cannot prove that he isn't a reflection of a reflection, who doesn't know whether he is flesh and blood or a character in someone else's tale, sets himself up to determine what's real. She chuckled. That's rich. So yeah, when I wrote that, I wasn't expecting it to be turned on me personally. So anyway, that's our unsettling bit of philosophy for today. I'm inclined to take Duncan Kyle's attitude and just say, I seem real to me, and let it go. And if perchance we are in a simulation, allow me to appeal to whoever's running it to allow me to sleep better at night. And let me tell you, Bostrom and Kipping's research is not helping much. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up. Our resources are down there, and please subscribe to our channel. Thank you.